All right, welcome everyone to the first uh, GLUE lecture of the year. I am Morgan Greenleaf, uh, a member of Core 4 at ACME POCT, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Stacy Heilman to introduce the session, and then we will get going. Stacy. Thank you so much, Morgan, and hello, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. As Morgan said, I'm Stacy Heilman. I'm the Associate Vice Chair for Research in Department of Pediatrics at Emory University, as well as a proud member of Core 4, which I will tell you about that in a moment. But first, I just wanted to start off by saying um, this is our first GLUE lecture since the spring, and we um, faced some very sad news uh, that Agnew PUCT did in last spring in the the passing of our dear friend and colleague, Dr. Oliver Brand. Uh, Dr. Brand was instrumental in beginning ACME POCT. And as this slide said, he served as a real inspiration to all of us. And we really move forward with that in mind. Um, if anyone's interested in donating to the Oliver Brand Fellowship, please do so. You can go ahead and scan that now. But as it relates to the ACME POCT, we are just um, so inspired by him and want to live in his image that we've renamed our lecture series as it relates to anything related to the ACME POCT, the Oliver Brand Memorial Lecture Series. And so that includes our GLUE lectures or the Global Lectures Uniting Everyone, which is the sponsor for today's talk. And before we get to our featured speaker, I wanted to tell you just a little bit more about the ACME POCT. So the ACME POCT stands for the Atlanta Center for Microsystems Engineered Point of Care Technologies. And this is a funded center through the NIH funded Point of Care Technology Research Network. The NIBIB funds our node, which includes collaborators from M University, Georgia Tech and Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. And so let me tell you just a little bit about how we're structured, which will give you some clues and kind of what our mission and our goals are. So here's a slide that really gives an overview of all the cores that we have and how we're structured and how we function. So the administrative core is led by Dr. Wilbur Lamb, which oversees all of the moving parts, including the technology core, which was initiated by Dr. Oliver Brand and now has been succeed. His successor is Dr. Eric Vogel from Georgia Tech, a clinical core that is led by Dr. Greg Martin, and our dissemination core, which is led by Dr. Eric Neal. And as I mentioned, I'm a member, as well as Morgan, of the dissemination core. And the reason why we're doing all the talking at the beginning of this session is because one of our main goals is to disseminate best practices. And so that's what we're here today. And that's why we've chosen our, this featured speaker to share with you his journey along this way. And importantly, I do also just wanna say that at the end of this, I'll drop a survey link into the chat. And I urge all of you to respond to that because we wanna know what you thought about today. And importantly, we wanna know what kinds of topics you hope for us to cover in the future. So please respond to that survey. Of course, contact us anytime if there's a topic that you'd like us to, to present to you all. But with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Erica Tybersky to introduce today's featured speaker. I hope you all enjoy. Thank you, Stacy. Hello, everyone. I am so pleased to introduce our speaker today, a friend and colleague of mine, Scott Ferguson. He is the CEO of Aptitude Medical Systems. I'm sure he'll tell you a lot more about his company, um, but just from what I know, their mission is to democratize diagnostics by enabling anyone to perform lab quality molecular diagnostics anywhere for less than the cost of a copay. Um, their lead product is a product called Metrics COVID-19 Test, and it was the first FDA authorized molecular diagnostic test to work with saliva or swab samples for at-home and over-the-counter use without a physician supervising. They created simple, accurate, and easy to use diagnostic platforms that fit in the palm of the hand and allows anyone to run a complex lab quality PCR test in their own hands in minutes. Um, this company has an aggressive and exciting pipeline um, aiming to develop a range of tests beyond COVID, including flu, RSV, strep, sexually transmitted infections, HPV, and others. And they are actively supported by ACME POCT, Radix, BARDA, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundations, um, and others. 
Um, the goal is to realize their products and deliver them both domestically in the United States and globally, especially in low and middle income countries. Um, so with that, Scott, I know there's much, much more. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Erica, for the, for the kind introduction and, and, and Morgan and Stacy and, and Eric for, for the opportunity to, to get to talk with you all today. Absolutely uh, honored by the, by the opportunity and, and really hope that this can be uh, helpful uh, for, for folks that are, are jo joining the session. And um, yeah, I should start with a disclaimer. I have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, <laughs> I just want to start off with that. What, what do I mean by that? Um, you know, this is very much a journey. What what Erica described is true. This is the, the status of aptitude. We're we're uh, we're a company that's that's uh, doing great work. We're solving a a, a really important problem, um, but this is not a, a a process that that is something that you can figure out right from the start and know exactly the path to follow and so i really want to share today with you some of the struggles that you know took place over the course of the the amount of time that it's taken us to get here um and and hopefully that these insights can be uh useful to you as well so to expand on what what erica mentioned yes yeah, so i'm the co-founder and ceo of aptitude and you know aptitude really sees a a, a tremendous <clears throat> unmet medical need in terms of diagnostics. So I think all of us recognize that um, when we're sick, the options that we actually have to uh, deal with that are pretty limited, right? So if you're if you're sick, generally you forestall seeking medical attention as, as long as possible, I think if you're if you're anything like me. And uh, and and part of the reason for that is the the options that we have when we're when we're ill are uh, generally inaccessible. So the, the front line of our, our, our healthcare journey usually starts with urgent care. And many of us don't go to urgent care because urgent care is not that urgent. We have to wait there for, for many hours uh, to actually see a medical professional. And critically, we, uh, we also have to pay a significant amount of money for that experience as well, not just a copay, but we have to take time out of our day, which you know can be can be costly to arrange either childcare or or take the time away from work. And also through our through our our our, our medical insurance. So the, the typical cost for a for a urgent care visit from the payer's perspective is around $700. And so, you know, this presents a, a pretty significant barrier to just be able to understand, you know, what the nature of the, the sickness you, you may have in the first place is. And telehealth has done a great job of being able to make access to medical professionals uh, more, uh, more available. Um, you know, you don't actually have to go into the doctor's office to actually see a doctor, but the, since uh, the majority of medical decisions require diagnostic information, that telehealth consult is limited in its uh, effectiveness because you basically still have to come in to get a diagnostic test in order to figure out what's go going on. And so what we're trying to do at Aptitude is really solve that missing link, basically make medical diagnostics as available as possible so that we can have a... Um, so that individuals can have uh, access to the continuum of care uh, uh, without having to leave their, their homes. And uh, critical to that is taking the performance of lab-based molecular tests and being able to put them into the hands of anyone that could uh, execute these tests in, in any type of environment and, and do it at a cost point that's actually... Um, uh, that's actually achievable for most folks. And so Erica mentioned that our, our goal is to democratize diagnostics and deliver diagnostics for less than the cost of a copay. So that's a that's a cost target that we're we're hitting, but we're we're not stopping there. We're we're our goal is to drive the cost of, of molecular down to the to the realm of antigen tests to make it truly uh, accessible and to deploy these solutions uh, globally. Um, so so that's a little bit more about aptitude. Um, we have one FDA approved or FDA authorized product uh, to date. So it's the first uh, over the counter molecular test for COVID that works with saliva or swab samples. And I'll actually show you the product so you can see it and you can relate to some of the stuff that I'm talking about today. Um, and it's just the first product in our pipeline. We, as Erica mentioned, are, are developing a suite of products for use in respiratory, uh, respiratory illnesses, sexually transmitted um, 
and diseases and beyond for use in the in the US market and and uh, and beyond. So why don't I first just show you what the what the product looks like so you guys get get a chance to see it. So the we call our platform the metrics platform. So this is a, a, a molecular platform, so not an anti antigen platform. And it consists of two parts. One is a reusable reader that comes in a little box like this, and the other part is a, is a is a consumable test kit that comes in a little box like this. And the reader itself is is a little unit you get to keep and you can be in your uh, it can be in your little medicine cabinet or your sock drawer or wherever you want to have it in your house and it's a small electrochemical reader it connects to bluetooth and wi-fi and uh, you can get your results directly from the the lights that are on the front of it here and it's a simple USB-C power device so you can just plug it in and it, and it starts right up so that's the reader component and then there's the consumable kit and so for this you can just open up the kit which i'll do in front of you here and it um, comes with some instructions that we've developed, as well as uh, a few components. There's a, a collector, a cap, and a, and a sensor, which I'll show you in a second. Sorry, up. And a little sensor. And the way that the assay works is, is very simple. So this is the first test that can work with saliva or swab samples. Um, so you can either deposit saliva, you can drool into this uh, little collector device, and there's actually a small black line here that you need to approximately hit uh, when depositing the saliva. So you can do, do it that way, or you can do um, a, a traditional anterior nasal swab, so just swab the front of your nose, both nostrils, and then uh, deposit the, the swab into the, into the collector here and snap off the the, the swab handle. Then there's a, a cap here, which contains a, a blue liquid. This is a special formulation that we've developed. And you snap on that cap, it creates an irreversible seal here uh, and releases the liquid. And you can just shake up the, the device here. This uh, elutes the virus from the, from the swab. And in the instance of saliva, mixes up the saliva. And th this blue liquid contains um, compounds that uh, ameliorate the interference that are present in the, the biological matrix, lyses the virus, and, and protects the RNA. And so that's the sample prep module. Then the next step is the, the sensor. And you take this uh, little sensor unit, take the bottom off the collector, and snap, snap the pieces together like this. It um, makes a little snapping sound. It's kind of like putting Lego pieces together. And now this, uh, this connection pushes this blue liquid into the, into, the, into the sensor, fills up the channels that are the microfluidic channels in here, and uh, contacts the uh, reagents that are in this device. And uh, it's ready to go. So you simply plug the device in, and the reader starts running. And then uh, within 30 minutes for this test, uh, you'll get the result uh, on, the, on the reader. And for our uh, for our, the COVID flu product that we're developing, you'll you'll get the results in about twenty minutes instead. Uh, so we're making continuous improvements to it. So that's that's the existing uh, product, and that's currently available uh, on the market right now. And as I as I just mentioned, our, our next product that we're developing is a is a, a COVID flu uh, multiplex product uh, that uh, hopefully will be on the, the the market soon when we complete our our clinical studies for for that product. Um, so, so that's the that's the that's the product in the platform. And what I want to try to highlight in here is this isn't a you know a product pitch or anything. What I'm trying to highlight are some some key features that we have uh, focused on in the development of this process. So I mentioned earlier we have this goal of democratizing diagnostics. Um, so what does that mean? So that means that um, we need to deliver performance of lab tests. We need this to be accessible so that people can actually use it. And it, it needs to be cost effective so that like economically this makes sense. And so those are kind of design features that we had um, as kind of guiding principles in, in, in making this, this system. And so there, there are a number of design features that, that, uh, that, that, that capture that. So for example, although this does have connectivity uh, features, you don't require the connection to actually see the results. Some folks, you know, struggle to use, uh, uh, you know, their iPhone or, or other smartphones or just certain age categories don't like to use that stuff. So you can get the results directly by looking at the, the device. Um, for these, these features where you snap stuff together. So we, we tested this across a, a broad range of um, uh, 
age categories and um, and strength levels to, to make sure that this is a test that truly anybody could put together. And we tried to keep the design elements as simple as possible so, so that could happen. And critically for the, for the cost element, um, generally folks are, are, are forced to, uh, you know, pick between like a, a, a relatively simple low cost consumable, uh, but at the expense of high complexity instrumentation and, um, or, uh, you know, slightly more expensive consumable with a, with a, uh, you know, a, a instrumentation that's slightly less uh, expensive or a, a very expensive consumable with no instrument uh, whatsoever. And so, you know, none of those approaches really resonated with the, with the design principle that we were uh, trying to go for. And so what we tried to do was pick technologies in this system that basically scale better and allow us to achieve uh, better economics. And so the, the backbone of this device that we're, we're utilizing here leverages um, similar uh, principles from the blood glucose sensor industry. So we thought about like, what is the most uh, you know, widely pervasive uh, at home, low cost testing solution? And it's blood glucose sensors, right? There's billions of those produced annually for, for pennies. And so our goal was to, uh, to make that as part of the backbone. We also invested in, in chemistry and developing novel chemistry that uh, is, is hard up front, but uh, can, can scale a little better. And we also, we harvest input energy from the user in ways that they don't really notice that, that allow us to make significant simplifications to the product. So those are some of the kind of core design philosophy elements that we implemented and really wanted to make work in order for this, this product to come together and be a holistic uh, uh, platform that, that could really make sense. And so the result of this is a platform that really can achieve a, a lower cost uh, uh, price point. And we have you know, significant resonance on this uh, concept. We, we, we have um, you know, funding support from Radex to continue to expand the platform from BARDA, and as well from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to extend this platform to, to other targets that can be used in, in low and middle income countries. And I see, I see a number of questions coming through. So I'll stop jibber jabbering and, uh, and maybe we could uh, address yeah. them. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thank thank you, Scott. Um, I, I want to mention that um, the the reader it makes a lovely demonstration when you have it in your suit pocket, so it's fit it's designed <laughs> perfectly for for that application as well. Mm -hmm. um, before we get to some other questions, we did have a couple in the chat here that are maybe relevant to the specific technology, which is, can the user run both a saliva and a nasal swab at the same time? I'm guessing not, but could you comment on that? Yeah, just one or the other. Uh, yeah. Just one or the other. And I think it's in your IFU, but what is the clinical performance difference between the two technologies? Which one is? Um, yeah, very good. Has very it good. better, but more sensitive, perhaps? Yeah. So the 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 swab performance is better. So we had a, a PPA of I think ninety seven percent, NPA of ninety eight percent. For the saliva, it was around ninety percent. So. Uh, a little less for the, the saliva. Now, it has to compare to an NP swab comparator. Um, mm -hmm. And you can imagine that the, the differences between the, the matrices actually matter in terms of the amount of uh, virus that's, that's, that's present there. Um, and so, in fact, if we used a saliva comparator, we, we had, uh, I think it was around 96% uh, PPA against a, a, a saliva comparator. So saliva to saliva, it's it's pretty consistent. But we recommend for users who who are buying the molecular test, generally they want the highest possible performance. So we recommend mm -hmm. folks use the the swab sample. But for folks who you know have uh, are prone to nosebleeds or on anticoagulants mm -hmm. or just hate swabbing for whatever reason, uh, saliva offers a great uh, alternative, and so it kind of improves the accessibility of this uh, approach. Yeah. Saliva is better for the uh, for pediatric indications too. Just mentioning that. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And um, Harold uh, Solomon from Georgia Tech has a question that I was actually interested in as well. So you mentioned at the top that you're really focused on the telehealth market specifically. And maybe um, before you go to the question, I was curious, um, the, the device does connect to the internet. Is that, did I hear that right? Yeah, good question. So in this, in the current, in the current, uh, current version of the, the firmware that's released at this time, this does not, but that it has all the hardware to support that. And so we'll mm -hmm. release that functionality in a, in a subsequent iteration of this device, but in short, yes, this can connect to the internet through Wi-Fi. Got it. And I'm curious if you could speak a little bit to why or why not you might 
want the device to connect to the internet. And I'm actually thinking of a, another yeah. a test provider. Um, their device did report results, for example, to uh, the CDC, and people really did not like that, actually. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that decision. Yeah, so there's a couple of things. So one, so we're, so yes, our goal is to support, so two two parts to the answer to this. Uh, so our goal is to support distributed diagnostics. And so, you know, part of that, it's easy to talk about in the home, right? Because uh, that's what obviously comes to mind in, in, in those instances. But there's a tremendous amount of like market building that has to happen there. Um, still at this time. In the meantime, mm -hmm. even in the professional settings, there's a tremendous amount of growth into further um, further decentralization, right? Into, for example, physician office labs, even into pharmacies where, you know, testing can occur as well. So those like, like more um, decentralized professional settings are also part of our, our, our um, the market that we're serving. And we have a, we have a, a, a great competitive advantage there. And that's actually part of a strategic, uh, play because we we see still some uh, market building that has to happen on the on the consumer end, um, and uh, as a as a sort of a, a stepping stone towards there is a a, a very significant uh, professional market play that exists as well. And so the connectivity elements that we're building into this thing need to support both use cases. And so in uh, in the professional uh, part, connectivity is is quite important for uh, you know. Uh, electronic health record integration, et cetera. Got it. Makes makes perfect sense. Um, David Godfrey has a question about the technology, but David, if I'll put you on hold just for a second, I want to actually um, go to the development of the assay, which maybe could uh, you could talk a little bit about the technology. And um, many of the folks we have on the phone are academic uh, um, you know, assay developers themselves. And if you could think back to the mm -hmm. The, the the long process that it took you to get to this 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 place where you have this beautiful um this reader yeah. and the and the consumable what were some of the challenges uh specifically technical challenges that you had to overcome to get this test on the market yeah I, I think that's a a great question so I'll I'll answer this in in two parts as well so um, I glossed over how how the heck we got here. In fact, I didn't even really talk about it. So let me like zoom in on that that part a little bit because I, I don't want to make this sound like a, a you know a, a happy fairy tale because this was this was hard. <laughs> so um, about over now over ten years ago, we founded the the company. Um, so I I did my PhD at UC Santa Barbara. Aptitude is located in Santa Barbara. And um, that's where I met my two co-founders, uh, J.P. Wong and Jackson Gong, um, who are also doing uh, PhDs there. Uh, we wouldn't have aptitude without them, and they're you know still part of the team and, and playing very very important roles in the in the company. And um, when we founded the company, it I think directionally was aligned with what we're doing uh, today. We wanted to have an impact on healthcare that solved uh, important problems. But what the specific company was you know, set up to do was was pretty different. Actually, we we went through a few phases in our in our in our history. So we spun out the the company from uh, Professor Tom So's lab at, at UC Santa Barbara, focused on a couple of nuggets that we thought were innovative and you know potentially commercializable. So one of them was uh, integrated microfluidic electrochemical sensor technology, and another part was. Um, basically exploiting nucleic acids, uh, not just for, you know, amplification in, in these types of molecular assays, but also as ligands in, in the form of next generation aptamers. And so um, we spent the first portion of our company's existence actually focused on sort of like a service model. We were developing molecules, aptamers, uh, for, for other companies to deploy into, into their products. And why? Well, that was something that we thought was... Uh, achievable and it was able to generate some revenue and and generate uh, some market validation of that that approach um but what we found during that time is that was um you know strategically uh, a little frustrating for for us in terms of like how we set up our model because we could generate really good good molecules that would go into somebody else's product and then what happened to that product? There are so many other things that could stop that product from from ultimately right. going to to market, and and we didn't have the um, 
the depth to be able to uh, help push that all the way through and, and make that really happen. And so um, the second phase of our company's uh, existence was to, to really focus on creating the full solution. And we actually um, began began development on, uh, on, on some actually therapeutic compounds utilizing our, our Aptimer technology, but um, also on the, on the diagnostics front, uh, driving forward with this electrochemical sensing technology. And actually we developed the first um, point of care uh, coagulopathy sensor for use in, in, uh, in, in, in trauma um, care. And that product's still under development. Um, but that that product was was most advanced when we began the pivot to this metrics platform and developing the the um, developing this system as you saw today. And so basically where we were at when when COVID hit was we were trying to move forward on both of these product fronts and finding tremendous amount of resistance to actually do it because everything was shutting down and right and um uh, it was it was quite difficult, and so we we recognized that there was a uh, kind of a shift that was taking place in the landscape where, you know, this vision that we had about more um, decentralized diagnostics um, would be accelerated through 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 COVID from essentially folks recognizing one that um, being able to access diagnostics in the traditional settings were highly problematic, right? Uh, people just couldn't get tests for, for quite some time. Then eventually folks started to be able to get tests and we we're you know, training a user base on being able to run their, their own tests in a way that had never existed before. And uh, FDA also took a, a, a very uh, open-minded approach to, to more OTC uh, testing being uh, a possibility. And so we sort of perceive this as a fundamental shift in the landscape and we all hands on deck began to focus on the on the on the COVID part. Um, so so during the journey, I think you know it, this wasn't a technological thing that was challenging for us. It was it was really figuring out like how this company would would be able to you know satisfy a product market fit, starting with like a, a technology that could be really useful, but having you know an, an unclear understanding of where that would best fit into the market where this could best achieve the, the the most impact and how we could do it with the with the resources that we had available and and be able to accrue more resources to pursue that 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 direction so that was actually where the biggest struggle was throughout this journey wow does that make sense and yes absolutely and and i'm just curious you know what you know at the beginning of the pandemic how much of the the platform was already built for for this coagulation uh, assay and sort of like what about that technology or even your team or your outlook enabled you to pivot to covid because that is not an easy thing to do with a technology you've been working on for a long time yes yeah absolutely so yeah very good very very good question so yeah, I think in terms of, there were two kind of foundational things that we had uh, going for us that made this pivot possible. One is exactly what you said on the team side. So, you know, during this, you know, existence prior to prior to the, the current, current product, we developed a really great team. So we have an, a, a fantastic culture here. And this is something that I, you know, I, I hate to give advice, but if I reflect upon like what was, was, was really successful for us was really helping to develop a great culture of, of uh, in, in our organization, uh, which is essentially like an operating system for how, 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 how a team works together. And it has a lot of leverage. And so that helps to decide like, you know, who are the right people to bring on board the team and how does that team work together in an effective way? And what was so important during this, this pivot is that is scary, exactly as you're talking about. We've made a lot of progress on something. We're going to pause all of this stuff, mm -hmm. maybe stop it and 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 focus on this, this other thing. And, you know, that's not something that you can just say from the top down, right? This needs like full, you know, full buy-in across the, the organization and a true entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, to be able to to do this and uh, and deliver in an all hands on deck manner, and this was just like such a spark moment for everybody on the team. Um, and so, if we hadn't, I think, built the the right culture and brought the right people together, this this would not have worked. So that that I think was probably the most important foundation in the in the whole thing. 
the 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 other element technology wise you asked about like what what parts of the the coagulopathy sensor were leverageable uh, the, s several features so the the um the core reader technology that exists here is is basically the same thing as what we had in the the the, the coagulopathy uh, sensor. It just it looks a little different, um, but the the core part of that's the same. And also this like um, in the consumable, the front end of this looks a little different and stuff like that. But but the core part of the consumable also is 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 quite similar. So we were able to to leverage some um, key pieces of each each one of those things, um, and. Uh, yeah, so I think those are those are the couple of elements. Uh, we were fortunate in, in both of those categories. Yeah, it it always comes down to people. The more the, these I, conversations yeah. I have, it always comes down to the people. <clears throat> and I I have to ask, uh, you know, coming out of a PhD and coming out of a research environment, how did you learn to build that human operating system? You know, what? How did you learn? Did you did you learn on the job? Did you? Um, you know, I don't think they really teach that. It's uh, part of a PhD, typically. Yeah, good question. Uh, no, they don't. So, um, uh, yeah, th three parts to this answer. So let's see. So one, a PhD doesn't teach you that, that's for sure. But it teaches you to um, figure things out. Um, that's a pretty important element of it. So, so that component came from there. Um, UCSB also offered this new, uh, something called the... Uh, the new venture competition as part of a overall program in new venture creation, sort of like a mini mini MBA. And um, that gave us, I think, courage to, to do things, <laughs> to do this kind of entrepreneurial journey in the first place. So that was an element. But everything else, I think, um, really what I started off with, you know, the statement, I don't know what I'm doing. I actually fundamentally believe nobody knows what they're doing um, at any given time. And, and this is something that I need to remind myself all the time. Um, why? Because we can be wrong a lot. And if you recognize that you can be wrong a lot, you can learn things way faster. And, um, you know, during struggles, it's really easy to like hope for a superhero who might have this like missing piece of the, <laughs> the puzzle mm -hmm. come in and swoop in and figure out how to like solve, solve your problems. Those people don't exist. Um, everyone is good at their little piece of the puzzle. And, and your job as the, you know, entrepreneur is to be able to zoom out and figure out how to put these pieces of, of puzzle together. And, you know, I mentioned before, directionally, we, you know, kind of knew where we're going. Actually, if I, if I project about um, you know, where we're at now versus, you know, what, where, where I thought we might be some time ago, it's, it's, it's very much in that, that, that direction. Mm -hmm. Um, but is this what it looks like, or could I have envisioned how that, how that actually, uh, would shape out? I have to say no. Um, it, it, it and and if I don't believe most people that would say that they knew exactly what this thing would look like, it's and that was also taught during a PhD, which is that you know progress is not linear, um, and you know you have an objective, but you have to respond to the data that you receive, and you know recognize that you have significant blind spots and try to try to fill those things in, and so you know that has been kind of a consistent theme in in our journey here. Um, so and I'm not sure if that fully answered your question, but. Um, it it does, you, you know, if I could summarize, it's, you know, have the humility to, to realize that you can be wrong and to learn from that and continue to apply that lesson over and over yeah, again. That, that's actually one of our core values. So that, that, that was the thing that we were quite intentional about is defining like what as a team are our core values, like what needs to be really in our, in our operating system. And some of those core values for us came naturally. Some of them were kind of aspirational, uh, uh, things as well. And, um, but humility is, is absolutely one of them. Yeah. Um, I know this is uh, maybe relevant, uh, recent, recent experience, but uh, Serge from the chat did ask if you had any specific wisdom about working with Radex and Barda. And I don't know exactly the context of that, uh, Serge, if you wanted to come off mute and ask a more detailed question. Um, hi, yeah. Um, I mean, it was it was in mind with uh, being a small startup company and working with large complex organization like that and um you know how you get to know each other how you 
how you try to present some, if, you, if you're highly innovative and kind of very cutting edge, then is there any wisdom on how you presented some of that information or you worked with people to gain some credibility and, and how did things evolve basically over time? Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, so yeah, I'll try to answer that question in two two parts. So one, so we were in Radex, actually, this is our second time in Radex. We were in Radex once and we got put into the redirect uh, uh, group. And so um, we, you know, had kind of a limited budget and, and kind of scope at that, that time to, uh, we were still able to be successful. We exited out of that program. Um, and um we're, we're now in in the in the radix 3 program as well having created a lot of success in in the meantime um so in in that regard uh you know progress is important so that was kind of a data driven uh data driven assessment on on that front and so you know do do you have the 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 necessary data to support uh the the funding decisions and that was similar for for barda now with BARDA, that was an, uh, kind of a, a mechanism we didn't have previous experience with. We were able to um, get connected with uh, some folks who did have a little more experience in being able to um, kind of navigate that process because it is a very long process from start to, to finish when you, you know, put in a, uh, your pre-proposal and, and until you get invited for a full proposal and then ultimately get... Uh, invited for funding negotiations. That's a very, very long process. And so we we um, were able to find some uh, consultants who are able to help, you know, provide some guardrails and, and also mm -hmm. set some expectations on, on that front, which was tremendously helpful. And in fact, through this journey, we, we also, that was a muscle that we developed through this journey, which was, uh, um, you know, finding non-dilutive funding sources and and leveraging them for the for the for the immediate projects at hand and, and also to build kind of core competencies within the organization that could be leveraged for for future stuff as well and i can say that early in the the company's existence i think we had the expectation that oh this could be a pretty fast journey to success and obviously that wasn't true and you know funding cycles take a really long time and so it's easy to discount you know doing those uh doing those things um but when I think back on it, thank God we did because it you know it takes a very long time to to actually uh, achieve success when you're doing something that's technically very challenging and you know at the forefront of a new market opportunity as well. Got it. Thank you. I uh, I want to continue to sort of riff on that theme, but maybe expand it just a little bit. You know, for for and also um, I see your question uh, Nasir in the in the chat. Um, you know, for for early stage developers, you know, maybe they've just started a startup, licensed a technology out of a university. Maybe they're just just getting going. What what would you advise for them to focus on in terms of um, their you know usually very small team? You're a three person team starting. You know, there's all these aspects. There's finding funding. There's working on regulatory strategy. There's like just work on the technology itself. You know what? What would you advise people focus on in those early days? Yeah, uh, very, very, very good question. So, couple, couple things. So, so an observation that I have is, you know, when it when there's a spark, right, to consider starting a new company, generally that's because there's some type of little breakthrough or some type of insight, right? And that can happen on the technology side. It could happen maybe on the on the market side, like you perceive a type of problem, or you know maybe there's a change in in a regulation in some way that can open up a new opportunity in in that way. And if if you're fortunate enough to like get that insight or be a driver of that innovation, that's awesome. But that's just back to that puzzle. That's one piece of that of that puzzle, mm -hmm. and. Um, Generally, that has come out of a lifetime of specialization, right? What are we doing here in in, in academia, right? We're we're all these extremely specialized individuals that are like pushing out the sphere of knowledge a little bit further, right? And in order to be able to do that, we have to have like extreme focus. And so, by definition, that means we have extreme blind spots in all sorts of other areas. And and generally, we're used to being kind of individual contributors in those environments, right? Where you you're kind of the the one who's making this 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 stuff happen, 
And so a switch has to flip, which is that you, you can't just be an individual contributor anymore. And you have tremendous blind spots and you need to, in order to be able to make this little spark go further, you need to fill in these, these other gaps. And so at the same time, you're also a driving force for this, this initial gap and it's in a competitive space. And if you stop on that front, I mean, generally in, in, in academics, you, you, you get enough to publish a paper, right? But there's quite a, another gap that you have to do in order to actually make a product, right? Um, it's not done at a paper stage, right? And so, so by definition, what that means is you gotta keep driving on the, the, on the technical development front but you have to fill in all of these other these other features. And what are those other features? Well, I could say things, but if you know, it might not apply to, to everyone's uh, situation here. But uh, from from our experience, there's a, 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 a few things. One, you, you, uh, when starting a company, you gotta you gotta get the framework of that right. So get some good legal support to get set up properly, and then just move past that. There will be some legal questions that come up again and again and again, but just get that framework set up properly. Similarly, on the IP front you know, figure out a rough IP strategy. This IP stuff is going to be useless if you're not successful as a company. So don't spend all your life trying to figure that stuff out, but get it right. to an okay spot. Um, and then figure out this product market fit thing. That's the most important thing to do. There's no playbook. Well, there's playbooks for how to try to do it, but there's no like follow this process and you will arrive at a clear answer. Uh, because generally, the nature of the, the new thing that you're doing is people haven't thought about it in this way before. And so it's gonna be hard. Um, and that just requires talking with lots of people who have different pieces of experience. And again, you're assembling a puzzle. Nobody's gonna synthesize these pieces the way that you need them synthesized. You need to do that, but you gotta collect those pieces. So um, I would say if you can get a, a, a team of, of co-founders who can, you know, continue to focus on driving the technology forward and then help figure out these, these other aspects of, of the business and product market fit, that's a, a very compelling uh, initial start. Yeah. And you actually had an interesting, you, you sort of found product market fit being a service company in a way. You sort of, and it's it's hard to uh, actually maybe if we could touch on that for a second. So you you kind of had product market fit. What you know you said you weren't quite satisfied because you weren't making a product. But how did you push out of that kind of like semi state that you were in? Yeah, that, I think that's a very 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 good question. We we had some um, I don't know how to say it like. Uh, uh, I guess identity crisis. I don't, know, I don't think that's quite the right word, but we had like some some life choices to make because sure. we were doing pretty well in that configuration. We were providing us a service. We had kind of a lifestyle thing going on, but when we went back to our kind of core goals, like why the heck are we doing this? You know, we wanted to achieve, a, as I mentioned before, a significant impact to to benefit uh, unmet medical needs, and we felt like that just wasn't happening. And so that was really kind of the, the it wasn't like an economic thing. Uh, it was really just an, uh, back to that North Star concept, right? Mm -hmm. We weren't quite on that pathway. And we leveraged, we were able to leverage a lot of learning there because we worked intimately with different developers during that, during that time and got, got an understanding of how, how things were, were, were looking on that front. And so that also gave us some, some confidence to be able to start building out the product uh, stuff with with a with a improved foundation and a little more improved financial foundation as well because we were able to get revenue from those those previous uh, work. Got it. No, that's that's really insightful. Um, and I do want to touch on so Nasir in the in the chat here, um, who is a mover and shaker here at Emory University, um, and uh, he has a question really about risk reduction. So where in the process of developing specifically a diagnostic, because I think it's a sort of a challenging business overall, where was the biggest drop in risk in terms of the, you know, whether it was a clinical stage, a product market fit stage, a funding stage, you know, where would you say that that happened in your, in your process? Uh, I mean, that's, that's such a, a, such a good question. It's really tough to answer because <laughs> it's one of these things where like, if not everything comes together, everything falls apart. Right. So, sure. um, uh, but yeah, I think, 
Yeah, I can answer that in a couple of ways. One, we had a high degree of confidence on the technology front. I think, you know, we invested strategically in saliva because we're trying to do this platform. We want to, we care about accessibility and stuff like that. We could have stopped earlier and just focused on the swab thing. It would have been way easier and had product to, <laughs> to market earlier. Um, so um, why am I mentioning that? You know, risk is also related to how you're thinking about what the, pro what the like, target product profile is that you're really building. You know, did you really identify the core unit that you should focus all your energy on and go, go to market with? So there's like some strategic risk in, you know, defining that from, from the outset. And that's really tough, right? Because you got to pick something that's going to be competitive. Um, and so you, it's got to be good. Uh, but generally that means you got to work on it longer, but then time passes. When, when do you stop, <laughs> right? When is it, when is it good enough? So that's, you know, um, that that's not a risk that you can just burn down and ret retire in that way. But actually, it's a really key piece to the to the overall uh, the overall puzzle is really, you know, there is risk in how you define what it is that you're shooting for, where you're setting that goalpost. Um, other risk uh, is financial risk. And so um, if you don't have funding to do stuff, you're not going to do stuff. <laughs> uh, and so what was our approach on that front? Well, we, you know, we, as I mentioned before, we, we tried to, um, we, we had developed some muscle around non-dilutive funding, which was helpful mm -hmm. and, and, and leverageable. Um, we, you know, sought private investment. We ended up getting a strategic investor uh, based on um, some of the progress that we were able to achieve. We also, during the COVID pandemic, set up a CLIA lab and started running um, uh, lab-based diagnostic tests. We became a leading COVID test provider in the Central Coast, and we brought in a ton of money from that, which was really a bunch, a bunch of development. Yeah. Um, so we took a very like intentional approach on like we need in order to get this thing done to where we need it, we need like an order of magnitude more money than we currently have. And how can we do that? And, you know, which method can 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 act first? And so some things were within our control, some things were less within our control. And we placed multiple bets on that front and, and worked really hard at, at doing that. So once we had that financial uh, support, that was able to retire a lot of risk because a bunch of, you can place now multiple technical bets simultaneously and uh, and, and navigate it uh, that way as well. So I, I guess that's what I would say to that question. Got it. And I'll say, I've had a few of these conversations now and what you're saying about a muscle for non-dilutive funding, I've heard a few times, which is take as much non-dilutive funding, continue to apply for whether it be SBIR, STTR, different phases, whether it be, you know, R1 or even academic funding, you know, that is a path that many people have taken. So it's good to hear that uh, echoed by you as well. Um, before we go to questions, I want to ask you a little bit to look into your crystal ball about diagnostics and about, you know, obviously COVID has changed things. You know, the, the market for diagnostics has also changed, you know, Famously, um, Lucera, the maker of the first fl flu COVID test, uh, went went bankrupt. And I know you mentioned at, at the top that you have um, really a mission around democratizing diagnostics beyond just COVID. So I wonder mm -hmm. if you could look into your into your crystal ball, maybe two, three, five down years down the road. You know, what are we going to be using your test for? Common colds? Are we going to be using it for STIs? You know, where do you think the uh, the market and your test will go yeah great great question so yeah a couple couple points on this one you know when you have like a global situation I, I talked before about like a little spark right like some some kind of change that happens in the landscape that's kind of leverageable and a bunch of things can happen like the market generally is kind of at a roughly an equilibrium right and when there's a change in that you get a you get a gradient and uh, there's a lot of movement that that exists there and there was a huge response to covid right and some companies like built up huge to respond to that need and then became so big that they, when COVID went down, could not keep going. Um, and, you know, th that's not how we're structured. So we, you know, have been, you know, kind of gradually growing the, the company. We're still a small team, about 40 people. Um, and, um, 
And our goal is to, you know, achieve, achieve that mission. And so, you know, we're, we're not perturbed by the, the, the sudden growth and then decline of the, the COVID market at all. This is a, a very helpful stepping stone. And if you think about like the, the forces that exist in the, in the marketplace, it's something very interesting has happened through thanks to COVID. One of them is, you know, again, back to people's expectation, right? People expect to be able to get diagnostic information more easily. Right, we we've been able to run, you know, hundreds of millions of people have run uh, their their own tests, right? And that's another element of it. People are are trained, right? Now there's a huge group of people that are trained to be able to run these tests. And this is also data that that FDA has has seen and has, uh, you know, updated uh, the, their mindset and has has taken public comment on, you know, where over the counter testing can can go in the in the future as well. And so um, we think that. And back to the economics as well. It's extremely expensive to go to urgent care. Why? You have to support this like this beast of a <laughs> mm -hmm. tremendous overhead. It's you know super inconvenient. So like fundamental features of the market are in, in place. There's a huge convenience argument. There's an economic argument. There's a change in the regulatory atmosphere that's that's quite significant. And there's some built-in knowledge that people have. Um, so those are forces that are pushing us towards, a, 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 I think, a more distributed diagnostic paradigm. But that still doesn't happen overnight. It's not like you just flip a switch and it can, you know continues. That seed has been planted and, and I think well fertilized through COVID. Um, so in, in a number of years now, I think we'll see more tests on the market that are that are doing this. And we will be among them, hopefully leading the way uh, for, for multiple for multiple indications. Um, so um yeah in short um yeah if i pr project in, in the crystal ball i think we'll, we will see more tests we will have uh, a number of those for sale here in the united states and, and then also available uh internationally in, in low and middle income countries as well um so yeah we see a bright future on this point but as i mentioned before that market takes time to build and we're, we're not solely focused on that there is still further um benefit for decentralizing diagnostics in the professional space as well. And we're, we're, we're able to support that movement as well. Got it. So basically the, uh, the, the, the gradient that you're talking about of basically familiarity with tests and uh, also the, the regulatory landscape, that's still present, sort of lingering from COVID. It's still yes. there. Yeah. yeah. Okay, wonderful. Um, we will pause there. And if anyone is brave enough to come off mute or you can put your questions in the chat, we do have um, two very specific questions um, about your technology. And maybe I'll, I'll start there. And if others want to put um, their comment in the chat, and then if I uh, go to your question, you can come off mute. But uh, Yoast, or I think is how you pronounce Yoast Bonson, asked about your multiplex capabilities um, and how, you know, how many different diagnostics could you fit within your, your single technology? Yeah, great question. So we, we have, uh, so this, this version of the, the device that I showed you has, has four separate wells, so we can do four, fourplex uh, spatial multiplexing. We have another version of this that has eight, so we can do eight plex uh, spatial multiplexing. And then electrochemically, we've also developed methods to be able to multiplex within a channel as well. So three-plex multiplex in a channel, eight channels, 24-plex in one of these little devices. And I guess a, maybe a different question beyond the technology, is there actually a real business case for that kind of multiplexing? Uh, that's a great that, that's a great question. So there's uh, an evolution that's taking place in, for example, the like syndromic testing in, environment, and you know what payers will pay for in 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 that in that that realm. So that's that you know that's unfolding uh, as as we speak in 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 front of us. But you know the 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 guiding information that or sorry the guiding uh, principle that we have there is, you know. Uh, there are there's you know certain diseases that have very similar uh, presentations, right? And so, if it was s similarly you know cost effective and the performance was there to be able to you know ask a more sophisticated question and get more uh, contextual data from that that answer in general, that should be a good thing. And so, um, uh, yeah, I won't speculate further than that. But in, in short, we see we see a potential there. Got it. That's that's good enough speculation. Um, 
And then Tamara Lambert asked a question about your um, coagulopathy assay, actually, mm -hmm. related to your clot detection. And if that is not released yet and you feel comfortable, don't feel pressure to to, to answer, but um, maybe yeah, could you could speak a little yeah, bit about I'm that. Yeah, I'm to share a little info. So yeah, so it's not, it's not, um, uh, so this is not like a tag or a row term that's, that's, uh, uh, assessing like this viscoelasticity or other mechanical forces. This it's a test that's actually looking for specific biomarkers of coagulopathy. So it's uh, measuring proteins of coagulopathy. Got it. All right. Um, Stacy or Wilbur or anyone from the ACME team, do you have any questions you want to ask, Scott? Yeah, Scott. Thanks so much for for being on the session. Uh, great, great story. Really appreciate it. You know, as Morgan said, a lot of our audience here and a lot of the audience who will download this uh, are coming from the academic side. So really have a similar background as you. Any words of general advice for uh, maybe a PhD scientist who really is looking into becoming an entrepreneur? Uh, yeah, I think, um, great question. If I rewind, People, when I was doing this, like my colleagues thought, ooh, this is, what you're doing is very risky. You probably shouldn't do that, or I certainly wouldn't do that. Um, I don't know if what we did is any more risky than what they did, which was, remember at the start when I said, I don't know what I'm doing, and I also said, I don't think anybody else knows what they're doing. They ended up working for companies with people who also didn't know what they're doing, and then, you know, lost their jobs from... <laughs> from poor decisions that were made in the, those companies that had a, a very adverse impact on, on those individuals. And so it's easy to think that, oh, I'll just go work for a big company and everything will be uh, great. The, there, there's significant risk on that front uh, as well. So if you take a bet on yourself, um, it, it might turn out better than you think. That's a very optimistic note. I think I kind of want to end there. That's a great way to end, uh, Scott. Um, Thank you so much. That was a wonderful conversation. I really enjoyed um, hearing from you and hearing your 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 optimism and your insights. Um, for anyone else who's listening, we will send out a recording of this. Um, please do take a look at the survey that uh, Dr. Howman put in the chat, if you wouldn't mind um, giving us some feedback. That always helps. And with that, we will end it here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right. Bye. Take care, everyone.